Hi, HR Nation, it's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we're joined by Danielle Ritigliano. Danielle is the HR Director Commercial for US and Americas. Uh, Danielle, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. How are you, Chris? Not too bad. Not too bad. Thank you for taking the time out to, to get involved. <laughs> it's nice to actually interview someone on the show who listens to the show. That's you know, <laughs> quite a weird one for me. So it's just going to be very interesting. Um, Daniel, tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your journey to where we are today. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, it's funny, a lot of people tend to fall into HR. Um, it was something that I always felt very strongly about, um, kind of getting started in my career and um, started in talent acquisition, um, organizational development, employee relations roles, and, and eventually worked myself up to, to being an HR business partner, um, where I'm currently with, with Volvo overseeing the Americas for the corporate division. Amazing. And what, what was it about HR? You said you fell in. Tell, tell us that story then. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, uh, it's funny because I actually went to college for opera. Um, oh, I'm really? a trained opera singer. Yeah, it's, so you it's can really sing funny. I can dance, so we can have a <laughs> Perfect. We got it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and I always was super passionate about people too. And I thought, you know, maybe I could do something kind of blending the two passions, somebody maybe with music therapy and um, just in taking an IO psychology class and, and an HR class, I really was so interested in it and, and how you make dynamic teams and how do you pair people together based off of their strengths to to really kind of magnify what an organization can can really achieve and um, so that was really kind of what got me started and just the complexity of it all and and, and the inspiration kind of behind it and um, and ever since I HR has been for me Wow so we almost just discovered it along along the, along the way it's, I love asking that question because everyone has a different story. Yes. And almost everyone, I would say 99%, no one planned <laughs> on going into HR. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's strange, actually, to speak to some of the, you know, the most successful HR leaders in the world, and most of them didn't actually want to think of doing HR. <laughs> um, I think that's the importance of trying things. I think one, yes. of, one of the advice I give to you know, my, my brothers and, and their friends who are coming out of university is just try things. You, you don't know what you like or, or, totally. or what you're going to do. Just try it. You never know. And uh, I think many people just, uh, they just get a job and then they just stay there. They don't taste different things and, and different opportunities. So yeah, fantastic. So where we are today then, what really occupies your mind on a day-to-day, day-to-day sorry, basis at Volvo? Yeah, I would say um, change management is a huge effort that um, I'm, I'm currently working on across the Americas. Um, there's so much going on in the auto industry net right now that's super exciting as it relates to autonomous driving, electrified vehicles, and what that means for us as an HR function and, and as a business um, is that it's really challenging us to kind of push past the norms um, to make sure that we're attracting the right people and developing the right people in our business that's going to take us to the future. Um, so that's something that's a huge push for us. And that's really kind of a red thread in everything that we're doing within the HR function at Volvo. So how, how are you managing that change? Because many companies I speak to, you have a similar problem to almost like oil and gas, where you've got the guys that have been there for like 40, 50 years. Yes. That, you know, this is what automotive is. You know, this is what oil and gas is. And then you've got the new guys coming in with the whole digital transformation. It's a very different set of skills, but also culturally completely Different. Correct. So how do you how are you merging those in together and <laughs> uh, yes. into the culture? Just out of interest. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the truth is is that we need both groups of, of people, and that both are equally as important as we're driving this change. And so it's about um, in change management, not catering to one group or another. I think it's really about being as inclusive as possible um, as an employer and creating a workplace where you're able to provide people with with different options that work for them and allow them to do their best work possible. So the way that, that we're kind of um, looking at it from Volvo is trying to move away from policies more to guidelines um, that allow for us to give our employees more flexibility to kind of pick and choose what works best for them, of course, within reason, um, but working towards putting together a more flexible um, dress code policy and also a more flexible working from home policy that 
Um, you know, if you're comfortable wearing a suit every day and you like to work nine to five, you're able to do that here. But if you yeah. also are a working mom and, and you enjoy, you know, being able to, to spend more time at home with your children, that we're also ab able to offer you that as well. So really trying to be as kind of open and broad in our policies has been something that's been really successful for us in terms of kind of catering to these two very different populations. Yeah. And that's a big shift, right? Especially within the industry, because everyone, even me, I spent the first 10 years of my career wearing a different suit every day, you know, new different tie. And that was like, if you didn't wear that, then, you know, didn't almost fit in. It wasn't acceptable. But now when, <laughs> I, when I started my own company, it almost seems silly for me to walk into an office with five of us wearing a suit. <laughs> 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 who, who am I trying to impress? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> who, am <I> trying to, <laughs> who am I trying to impress here? Yeah. Yes, very much. So. And it's very much, you know, I think it kind of goes back to empowerment and um, treating people like adults yeah. um, instead of, you know, telling them this is what you have to do and this is what you have to wear and when you work. And um, I just think the, the world of work is changing so rapidly and, and we really need to adapt to that to make sure that we're getting the best talent possible and, and keeping the best talent possible. Mm. When, when did you roll this out, these changes, or is that something you're currently doing? I'm just wondering. Exactly. You know, how, go, go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something that we're, we're currently doing and that we're working towards. Um, basically, what we did is we gathered a task force of employees. And, you know, I think sometimes as HR, we often think that maybe sometimes we hold all the answers or that we're, we're super in touch with our client groups or the employee base. But I think it's always super helpful to really make sure that you're hearing everyone's voice um, whenever you're kind of rolling out these things that are organizational, kind of across everyone, cultural things, because they really impact everyone. Um, and everyone really does have their own two cents on it. So it's something that I, I try not to take for granted. And I really try to leverage kind of getting everyone's uh, kind of inputs on, on different initiatives that we roll out. Um, so I put together a task force that was kind of volunteer only and tried to get um, it cross-functional and, and also- sides. From both yes, sides. exactly. <laughs> both sides of the employee groups and yeah. different functions to um, kind of come together and, and put together some recommendations, with, which we shared with the executive team a couple of weeks ago, um, which was really positively received. Uh, and, and so now we're, we're going to implement it and, and roll it out across the organization, which is something we're really excited about. What, what was the initial reaction? You know, when you're bringing together a guy who sits there coding for a living from a guy who's walking the shop floor of uh, your manufacturing facility. <laughs> I'm yeah. just, wondering, just wondering what the initial reaction was and, and when you brought that group together. Of course, it's a good thing because if they're volunteering, that's already a first step. Absolutely. <laughs> they're volunteering for it. So they're not going to go in there with any agenda. You know, the, you're, you're talking about your early adopters, right? Um, that yes. Happen to do that. But I'm wondering what was the initial reaction from the rest of the organization? You know, when you brought these two sort of cultures together, what were some of the challenges that you faced and the reactions? Yeah, I think um, it was funny because I think um, initially, I think that there was potentially some um, some friction maybe that people were anticipating or or assuming um, certain intents or perceptions of, yes. of one group versus another. Um, but it was really funny because the more that we talked, the more I think we realized that we're more similar and we are different um, and that it's it's not about catering to one group or another I think it's about just trying to be as flexible and as open as possible to kind of create almost like an a la carte menu for employees <laughs> to kind of pick and choose what works best for them um, instead of it being so prescriptive and so kind of like top top down kind of a mandate um, and I think once we approached it from that perspective um, I think that it was something that everyone could really get behind it and go for it's like listen you know Right now, it's something where it's kind of agreed upon between a, a manager and employee if, if you want to work from home. And sometimes um, some managers give it to some people and not to others. So why don't we just be inclusive about it and, and create some guidelines around it so it's something that everyone feels like they could take advantage of. So yeah. I think kind of when, when we kind of framed it more like, like that and as something that's more kind of open and that's about giving people options, um, it made the conversation much very easier. much less. Yes, yeah, exactly. Kind of fit everyone into one, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're changing. You have to do it. <laughs> and then, yeah, absolutely. And all, yes. all, all of a sudden everyone's like, no. And then you, then you have a big, uh, you know, trans big transformation <laughs> challenge on your hands. Right? <laughs> Whereas if you're saying to people, you know what, it's optional. We're going to empower you to take charge of your own, you know, your own, your own experience, whether you want to work for home. So it, did you have to do a lot of work then with the line managers and, and the senior leadership team now, of course, to, to upskill them? 
on how Correct. to deal with this because it's a completely different change for them <laughs> of how they yes. manage people. What did you do to do that? Um, Absolutely. So what we're, we're doing right now is um, we're going to start holding workshops um, and one-on-one -on -one sessions with managers because really it puts a, a lot more accountability on them. Yeah, exactly. Um, to really manage performance and, and to ensure that people are doing what they need to do regardless of when, where, and, and how. So um, that's something that we're, we're definitely um, going to make sure it is rolled out in a good way because we see that as um, really deterring, you know, the or really determining the success of whether or not, you know, these kind of loose guidelines are going to be able to, to fly or not. Uh, so that's something that that we're taking very seriously. Yeah. How do you, then how are you actually measuring performance now then? Is it a rating system? Is it a continuous feedback? Is it, you know, what, 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 how are you, cause I think these things are great that companies are doing. And then the biggest challenge they find is how do we capture this information and, you know, and, and look, look at it and measure it. And, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, currently the, the system that we use um, is, is more on the traditional side, once a year uh, performance review, which is something that, that we're looking to, to revamp um, for sure, um, especially in, in considering um, the fact that, you know, performance conversations shouldn't happen once a year. They should be continuous dialogues um, and it shouldn't, you know, in, in my view and in different kind of roles I've held, um, I, I like to kind of have it be outside of a merit conversation because I think it just puts a lot of pressure and a lot of stress around a conversation that should be much more development focused and, and should yeah. be more about goal setting and, and how you're doing and career pathing um, and, and, and it just kind of steers the conversation into to another way that I don't know is totally productive for uh, for either manager or employee or, or, um, the, biz or the business. Correct. Or the, absolutely. <laughs> Most importantly, the business. Yeah. Or the business as well. <laughs> so I think, you know, what we're really looking towards right now um, is to put together some systems uh, proposals that will allow us to have um, more robust conversations, more frequent conversations, um, to make it more about the conversation and less about what's my rating, what's my merit increase, um, yeah. and where do I fall amongst my peers. Because I think that goes in hand in hand in the type of change you're trying to create. And that type Absolutely. of culture, you, you know, if you're, because I'm wondering, you know, if those managers are making decisions of, you know, if someone can work from home or et cetera, do you, how do you, do you capture any of that information at the moment or of, of, you know, how many people are working from home at the moment? How do you know that? Do you, do, is there a way for you to know that at the moment to say X many people working from home or, you know, just, et cetera, just as an example? Yeah, um, currently we don't, um, which I think is, you know, right now, you know, the feedback that we've received is pretty anecdotal um, as it relates to, you know, manager sharing, you know, when it's maybe being abused or underutilized sure. or can I do this, but this one's doing it. So it's kind of like this gray area right now. So I think just you know, that's another thing that we're definitely looking forward towards and kind of rolling out these guidelines is, you know, being able to just have a little bit more structure around it so that we are able to, to track it and then measure it over time. Like, is this really increasing our, our productivity yeah. or is it doing the opposite? Yeah, I think uh, to, to make you feel better, most 90% of people that I've spoken to that have done the same thing have found amazing results. It's very rare. And as I said, you're treating people as adults <laughs> and trusting <laughs> they're actually going to do the job. If you can't trust them to work at home, then you shouldn't employ them in the first place. Absolutely. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they have to be in an office in front of you to deliver results, you've already lost. <laughs> in, my, in, in my mind so that's just uh, how it works so with this digital transformation you're going through what are the biggest challenges that you're having you know have you had to redesign for example your recruitment strategy your branding you know if i'm a guy coming out of university with a very great you know coding um uh, skill set am i going to be looking to work at volvo yeah yeah you know, you know, this is random you know, what thoughts that come to my head how are you attracting no. this talent Absolutely. And it, and it's super competitive. Um, right yeah. now, you know, we're hiring um, close to 100 software engineers and developers in the Silicon Valley area, which is the, the most competitive. The toughest market. area ever. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's, it's super challenging. And I think um, for me, for employer branding, I think it's really important that you're truthful to who you really are um, as an organization and what makes you different and unique. Um, and so that way you're attracting the right people because you want to make sure that you're not selling someone an empty promise or that you're not um, misrepresenting 
yourself in, in any way, um, because then you get into issues of, you know, lack of culture fit when that person does come into the door. I really nice um, away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I think what's, um, what's special about Volvo is, um, you know, it's kind of like this, this comeback story. Um, and it very much feels like a 100 year old startup is, is the best way that, <laughs> that I well. describe it, <laughs> yeah. uh, where, you know, we're right now we're implementing a ton of HR systems as it relates to timekeeping and even our HRIS system, uh, which is really funny because the company's been around for so long and has such a strong brand presence. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we are building a foundation, but also looking towards the future in terms of, you know, what is possible um, it, with, with auto. So it's, it, it's very much, um, you know, an exciting time to join Volvo and especially in the engineering community community. I think, you know, if you're a startup person, sometimes you're a little bit scared to go into a larger organization, but I, I feel like what's great about Volvo is you really kind of have the best of both worlds in joining us is that you do kind of have this infrastructure behind you of joining a larger organization and, and the excitement of a startup with it growing so quickly and all the different innovations that we're rolling out. Um, so yeah. I think for, for us, it, it's really about being honest about it and also knowing um, what our audience is looking for and, and, and letting them know our story. Yeah. Have you created, um, because many companies I'm speaking to now, they've actually taken it, uh, for example, if I think of Kuhn and Nagel, big logistics company, transport logistics, they actually separated their startup and their digital side completely from their commercial side. So they have another office just for the coders, the developers, you know, fun, magical, colorful slides, you know, <laughs> et cetera, right? And then they kept the, you know, the manufacturing logistics facilities and that office and uh, back end uh, uh, completely separate. Have you guys done that or have you just made an effort to completely integrate it? Because that is a tough challenge. It to is a tough challenge. Integrate old and new. A lot of companies have actually just, that I've spoken to, have said, you know what, Chris, we've actually decided that we're not going to attempt to do that and we're just gonna separate <laughs> and we're just gonna separate we're gonna keep yeah. you know you know our innovation hub center etc here and you know our, our, our actually you know our production line you know etc over here and you know we're not gonna mix it together just wondering what your approach is on that yeah so um for the most part um it's pretty segmented geographically not necessarily um as it relates to us working together as a larger organization i think um you know our um our Volvo car technology is what we call our, our mountain view area where we're um, building kind of the innovation in the future of, of auto. Um, it's pretty um, much focused in, in that geography at the moment as it relates to staffing and where that organization sits. Um, we did absorb um, and acquire um, a startup at the end of last year called Lux. Um, mm -hmm. That um, was a, a valet um, app. And as part of that, acquisition, um, we have kept a San Francisco presence um, outside of the Silicon Valley area uh, because that was something that was very important to them um, and also something that we saw as being able to be strategic in acquiring talent because there's some... That's where they are. Exactly. Be, be and where some, they are, right? <laughs> exactly. And there's some people, you know, that commute could be a little bit tough going out to yeah. Silicon Valley. So um, we are trying to be um, as flexible as possible, but for now, um, our geography as it relates to kind of the, the innovation is more focused on Silicon Valley given given the talent out there. It makes sense. It makes sense um, as well. So to be where the talent is, it's, uh, <laughs> that's already half the battle won. Exactly. Um, yeah. As well. But I know it's, it's very expensive, right, to live in Silicon Valley, right? Oh, it's very insane. much so. Is that, it's, it's insane yeah. expensive from what I understand. It <laughs> um, is. Yeah. Do you live? Do you live there as well yourself? Um, I actually live in uh, New Jersey currently. I did live out in the Bay Area for some time, uh, working in the advertising industry, um, also within HR. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, and um, you know, I love the the uh, Silicon Valley area, San Francisco. It's it's very beautiful, very expensive area. Um, <laughs> it's super exciting right now with um, with all the startups and technologies um, coming out there for sure. Mm -hmm. So your manufacturing is mainly in Sweden. So our, we're actually, right? um, or if I just made that up, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we do, we have plants in Sweden. Um, yeah. we also have plants in China. Um, and we're currently, um, building a factory in Charleston, South Carolina and hiring, um, close to a thousand people this year, um, to start manufacturing cars in the U S which is very exciting. Wow. Yeah. I've always associated Volvo with Sweden in Europe. You yeah, think Volvo, you think Sweden. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We we have a very strong Swedish heritage and uh, very much a part of our culture 
um, in the US as well. Mm -hmm. So when when we talk about the talent, what are some of the things you're doing then to attract the talent? You mentioned about, you know, being authentic, you know, telling your story and being very transparent about that. And, and I think that's so important. So I'm happy, really happy that you, because they're only going to come in and see it's not what you said anyway. If you try and exactly. sell, the, sell the dream to these guys, they have op- <laughs> and these, these are people with options. You know, these, these, these are not people that are, are struggling to find a job. You know, if they have no. that skill set, then they're in high demand and they know it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So absolutely. Now, if you don't have an authentic message, and they can pretty much see straight through that, so I'm really happy you mentioned that. But in terms of outside of that, what are you doing as well to attract these guys and to, to be visible to them? Yeah. Um, So some things that we're doing, um, we just went through um, a big campus recruitment push um, just to both from um, a Silicon Valley perspective and and trying to bring on um, some junior level talent there and then being able to kind of groom them from within the organization. We see that as being a huge area of opportunity to kind of get them in in the early stages, um, have them kind of build that loyalty with us and and get that kind of level of comfort in working with us and hopefully having a a fantastic experience um, and then being able to hire them full time after graduation so so that's one kind of strategy that that we're looking um, towards out there and then also um, as it relates to kind of that change management effort that that we were um, speaking about a little bit earlier for our corporate side um, we developed an internship program this summer um, that's really across all the different functions and that's also kind of meant as this kind of strategic talent injection into the organization so that we could um, start having more robust talent pipelines and, and succession planning Perfect. And where are you seeing the most results come from? You know, is it from the talent pipeline starting, you know, getting, getting in there early or what, yes. what, which of those, um, which of those, those sort of strategies are paying off for you the most? I would say probably getting them in early has been really successful for us. Um, we have some great success stories of, of people who started with us, um, you know, 10 years ago and, and have, are now, you know, director level plus in the organization. Um, and I think that that's really been um, very valuable to us and, and someone who understands the brand and, and the company. And it's just really a win-win situation, I think, to, to bring people in through an internship program or graduate kind of rotation program. Um, and, and that's something that, that we're definitely hoping to continue in the years to come. Mm. Uh, how are you dealing with the message into, you know, for the guys that have been there for, you know, 40 plus years, they're seeing this massive shift <laughs> to, to the digital side. How are you managing their expectations and managing their concerns? Uh, I know you obviously, you're probably going to say to me one-on-ones, you know, workshops, you know, you know, but I'm just wondering, you know, if there's anything else that you've been doing that that's really helped to, I know it's a continuous conversation. So just wondering if there's anything that stands out to you looking back that, either went well or things that you could do better, uh, just advice yeah. for, for other companies that are going through a similar process. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, I think there's two sides to it. I think one is uh, people need to understand the business need for change. And I think if you understand um, the business need, where the company is going, if senior leadership is um, aligned behind it, um, then that is to me half the battle. Um, in, in that. Um, and then it's, you know, from there, um, you know, that should really be um, driving our culture forward, kind of what, once that strategy is kind of defined, that to me, it kind of gives us a roadmap as to where we move forward from, from a culture perspective. Um, so, so for us, I think um, it, it's been really critical for, A, for, for everyone to get aligned behind that to understand why it's important that we change. Um, and then from a culture perspective, I think it's important that people don't see this as a, as a threat um, yeah. to their current ways of working, but that it's just something that's going to become the new normal for us. And so then it's about how do we adapt to that? And it's not um, changing for the sake of changing or changing for a worse way or taking something away that used to be there. I think um, it's just that we need to evolve as a business and as people, just as, as you do in life. And so I think that that's been something that um, has been successful for us in, in terms of, you know, ensuring that we're aligned in terms of our business priority and our strategy, and then kind of mapping it out from a culture perspective. And I think, you know, for change management, you're, it's, it, I'd be naive to say that every single person is going to get behind 
referring to. Um, there's always, you know, one or two who, um, you know, maybe don't understand or don't like it or, um, or whatnot. And I think um, it goes back to, you know, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, trying to be as clear as possible and as transparent as possible um, so that people don't feel as though there's a hidden agenda or there's something else behind us where there isn't. Um, I think is just really critical and, and, you know, that really goes back to, I think, you know, establishing trust, yeah. um, you know, between HR and employees and also management and employees. Mm. And, and as you said before, it, it needs to start at the top. All right. Yeah. And um, I'm just wondering when you decide to go for this transformation, did you, did you have a change in the leadership? Were, so were, there, we, were the changes that happened there? Cause in most cases that's all, all it's necessary. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, um, so we just got um, a new CEO um, at the end of last year. Um, our last CEO um, was here for three years. He was an expat from Sweden, um, did a fantastic job in really turning the America's business around. Um, and our new CEO, um, whose name is Anders Gustafsson, he's um, very much focused on and passionate about people and culture, which has really been um, fantastic for us as a business where of course, and for you as well in HR <laughs> if you've got absolutely. a CEO if that is important then you're already halfway there <laughs> absolutely and especially you know where we're at from from a change management kind of journey um, it's it's really great to have that now I think for us where um, I think that's really where where we need our focus um, you know not just as HR but as a business um, very much so right now so that's really he's really been a breath of fresh air for us and um, yeah Great. How, how, how have you been um, upskilling the managers? So I think we touched on it briefly earlier to, to deal with this because they're fundamental, yeah. really. You know, it doesn't work. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you can, even if you have the leadership bought in and if it doesn't go down to the, the, the line managers and, and, and distribute from there, then you've kind of failed. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how, how, how are you, what are you doing to upskill them and to build their skill set around this? Because it's a completely Absolutely. different way of managing. So we've been um, bringing in some um, trainings from um, Global in Sweden um, here in the U.S. We have a couple of trainings that are being rolled out towards the end of this year that are all about kind of leadership development courses um, where there's two modules. It's a pretty intensive course um, where after that there will be an action plan put into place to ensure that the learnings are really carried over from the training into the day-to-day -day work. Um, on top of that, um, we are also in the process of developing a mentorship program. Program, um, which is something that um, I think everyone has really been kind of asking about and um, and something that that's in development so hopefully next time we chat I could I could share sure, more with you on sure. that. Look forward to it. Uh, and um, and the last piece is one-on-one -on -one coaching um, so for managers who are either kind of um, designated as hypos or, or managers who um, need a little bit more support. Um, I am a certified executive coach. And so I've been spending a lot of time with them in terms of kind of really focusing on their development points and, and coaching them on a, on a weekly basis. Um, in regards to that. Mm -hmm. I know there's a transition stage where you can obviously, it's going to be you know, whilst they're learning and getting up to, up to standard. But I'm wondering once you get to that stage, do you have uh, something in place in terms of how to hold them accountable? Because I think that's the question I get a lot. When I, when I send out a, a message to speak to our leaders, they always ask me, Chris, how do the HR leaders hold their line manager accountable? What does that look like? So I'm just wondering how you guys hold people accountable um, for their self activities. Yeah. I think we are slow, slowly but surely getting there. Like I think some of these guidelines that we're, we're looking to roll out, it's putting a lot more accountability on our managers. Um, starting to move towards a continuous feedback cycle is also starting to create more of that accountability. I think it's very easy as HR, you know, everyone comes to you with a million questions a day. Can I do this? Can I do that? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, and what I've learned slowly over the course of my career is you can give someone the answer um, and they'll do the right thing. And it'll probably, you know, be for the best of the company and it'll be for make your life easier in the short term. But in the long term, you're never really teaching that person yeah. how to seek the answer themselves. And as sometimes scary as that might be as an HR business partner, where you're a little bit like, you know, want the reins on everything and make sure everything's <laughs> under control. And I got yeah. this. Um, it's, it's also, I think, um, really important to, to teach people and, and to sometimes allow them to maybe not do the right thing, but to also learn from, from doing that too. From the failure and making failure acceptable. That's Absolutely. A, that's a whole nother podcast we could go into there. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think HR is, I, I'm, I'm glad you said, that. I think HR is guilty of that themselves sometimes is not, oh, yeah. not, not letting go of those reins and allowing employees to, to experiment and, and fail 
and encourage it because if they're not yeah. failing they're not trying anything new <laughs> and, right. they're not, and they're not developing we're talking if you talk about innovation right you know imagine if people in innovation didn't fail they don't get anywhere oh absolutely <laughs> that's, absolutely that's, that's the whole point but it's a big shift it's it a, is especially it's for a company like volvo who who's in has that tradition the tradition there right and the top-down management structure uh having empowering your leaders and your your employees to 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 learn to experiment and try new things and fail and encourage that it's a big shift it, it is. It's a huge shift. And it's, um, it's been super challenging as, as HR, like it definitely pushes you in, in a lot of different ways that you've never really been pushed before. Um, but is also so fun and so rewarding when you yeah. see kind of these baby steps from, from managers who maybe, you know, started at zero and are now, you know, at, at 50, it's, it's just really exciting to kind of see those, those, that progress with, with people. Yeah, and it's a knock-on effect because once you let them fail and learn, then they actually take. Then the next time around, they're happy to to do it, and then it becomes actually just part of how they they work and operate. And the strain on HR, you can focus a lot more on on. <laughs> you guys exactly. will be focusing a lot more on strategic side uh, than answering these day-to-day questions every day. Uh, and so, it's just so many benefits for the business. Results, Absolutely. stuff happens, stuff moves there's movement because people are doing things and achieving it rather than asking questions and waiting for someone's permission to yes do it as well 100 percent. yeah so what was the initial reaction from the managers then when you're like okay guys you know you wanted you wanted it you wanted because a lot of time the, the managers they ask for it i want to be able to make decisions i don't want to have to and then all of a sudden when they when you empower them they're like <gasps> and they're like oh i don't know what if i fail and then you know it goes all the way around so it's yes. what was the initial reaction that you had it was it was you know some um i, I think initially were kind of like really you know and like kind of a little bit <laughs> are you years, sure 40 years Is of working yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah you know <laughs> but with the responsibility I, comes accountability and that's, exactly. and, and that's and that's what people don't think or they do think about it, but until it happens they're like oh yeah so <laughs> Exactly. And I think, um, you know, there's still times where, you know, they want that safety net a little bit of just feeling like someone from HR says it's okay. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, what I've been trying to do is really say, you know, are you asking me because you want me to give you the answer? Or are you asking me so that you feel more comfortable with your decision? And I think just asking that question too makes them start to reflect a little Great bit. Question. And it's, yeah, totally, you know. Totally a lot about their mindset as well. No Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, I think with all change management and especially um, in, in, in an industry like auto, that's literally kind of reinventing its core. Um, I think it's really important as a change agent, which I believe HR is and has to be in this journey um, to measure success in baby steps, because I think to think that, you know, everyone's going to change overnight or to expect things of managers that have not been expected of them for over 30 years in their career is not realistic. And so I think it's, it's really important to measure those baby steps and, and to also ensure, give yourself those little pats on the back. Um, you know, when you, when you have them like to ha- yeah. celebrate those little successes, because um, it could be, it could be tough a little bit, you know, to, to be that person who's kind of pushing everything forward, but um, it's, it's super rewarding. And I think um, it's been, amazing to kind of see some of these transformations um with with some individuals here it's been yeah. been really special it's going to take time like right? and and i was speaking with uh stefan chabonier he's the chief hr officer of l'oreal and they recently went through the same transition and he basically gave his leadership team and line managers a whole year so he's like for this whole year i'm not going to you're not going to not say not going to hold you accountable because of course but they basically gave them the leeway to learn to fail to you know to to under to to because it's a completely different way of working for them. So you can't expect someone to immediately just, you know, the next day Absolutely. understand how to do it. So they said, look, we're going to give you a whole entire year of training, support, guidance, and we're going we're gonna to do this together, you know, as a business. And uh, it was, he said to me, it was absolutely incredible, just letting people know that we, we know you're going to fail. We know things aren't going to go well. We know right. it's going to be a learning process, but we're all in this together. And I thought that was really cool that, that, he, really that cool. he kind of delivered that message globally that, you know, this is a massive shift in the way L'Oreal runs. But for us to stay ahead of the game and stay, stay ahead of the competition, we have to move quicker. We need to be Absolutely. agile. And all, all of us to be agile, we need to change the way we make decisions and empower leaders. 
Um, and I thought that was just incredible that the people, that everyone, everyone knew that. And, you know, everyone was like, no, not say you only got a year, that's it. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but it was just cool to say that to people that, you know, we expect, we expect things not to, it's, 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 right. it's a learning process. And then, you know, after that year was up, then people were held accountable. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's very cool. I, I really like that. Yeah. He, he, it took me a few seconds to think about it when he said it. I was like, but that's, that, that, um, you've got to let it, let people know that they're you they i find it hard you know whenever i hire a new new uh member of my team it's so frustrating because some people pick it out faster than others and it's natural like but it's hard because you're like oh, i can just do it myself then <laughs> and they're like, no that's the that's the defines the whole point of it but um just giving people just letting people know that it's okay is yes. a huge thing that most people just don't do absolutely um, takes all the pressure off and actually they actually make better decisions i, I completely agree yeah. That's great. What What are the other areas aside from transformation? You've obviously you've jumped into to, to Volvo, so essentially a lot of what you're doing, of course, is around around the big transformation you're going through. But I'm wondering for you personally, what are the other areas in HR that you're most excited and passionate about? Um, executive coaching is something I'm I'm super passionate about and excited about. Um, I just uh, received my certification through IPEC. Um, okay. Congratulations! For, thank you. And it, it to me, it's something that's so powerful because. It's allowing people to uh, to find the answers themselves, which kind of goes back to that whole accountability yeah. discussion. Also, kind of um, teaches you that you know wisdom is within yourself, and oftentimes you know what the answer is. Um, and all coaching is really is just about asking open ended questions that allow people to really kind of uncover things for themselves. And but it's they just know. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that, exactly. And it's just it's super powerful. And then when you you know yeah. when you change your mindset around certain things it really, it, it makes all the difference in, in everything, in your results, in the way that you interact with people, um, in your intentions and, and your positivity. And um, it's just, it just really impacts everything. So it's something that I'm super passionate about that um, I think is incredible because it impacts both your professional life and your personal life. Um, you know, we're not binary individuals and um, that's something that I think has been, um, I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, and, and that's, that's been awesome to kind of be able yeah. to, to do in my organization. Uh, something else I'm really excited about is mindfulness and, and happiness. Um, I think those topics are, are so great and I love seeing them kind of take legs in, in different organizations. Um, something that I did, um, two organizations ago was roll out a happiness course, which kind of taught oh, really? you how to. Yeah, which is tell, really tell me fun. more. I want to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, so it, it basically taught you that happiness is a skill that you can hone and develop just like anything else, and that you're in direct control of your own happiness. And it's not something that just happens to you or that's an outcome of life. You know, sometimes people think if I just get, you know, a ten thousand dollar raise, I'll be happy, or if I can lose twenty pounds, I'll be that'll be the, the key to my happiness. And um, there's things that you can do right now that will make you so much more happy. Um, than any of those things. And it all kind of lives with you. And um, all the studies around, you know, happier employees being more productive and staying in the organization longer. Um, it's just, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, it's a very powerful concept, I think. And yeah. um, so that was something that, that we rolled out um, back in my time at MEC um, on the West Coast. And, and I thought that was, that was great. Um, so what's the, what are some of the things we can do then to, to keep our, to stay happy? Control. So, yeah. So share think, more. Share more. <laughs> something that I yeah. Something that's a quick tip that I really um, I like to share with people. Um, it's important times that you maybe aren't fully um, in control of that time being spent. Um, that you maybe perceive it as a negative. So as an example, like commuting is a good example um, of something that change it from kind of being negative to a positive. You know, commuting is something that you have to deal with unless you're going to move your house and you know and relocate um that's something that you don't fully have you know control, control over. yeah you're like why am i spending three hours a day <laughs> exactly <laughs> for, yeah so what can you do in the, that, those three hours that's going to um give you joy so whether it's reading a book or listening to music or doing something that um makes you happy um that will allow you to focus your energy towards something that's more productive and that's more positive um, will give you that happiness instead of viewing it as something that's a time suck, kind of viewing it as something that's that's adding value in your life. Yeah, uh, so that's, a, that's a quick that's win. That's a good that example because, um, just sorry to jump in there, but I had a miserable journey every day on the, the London underground where it's just completely hot. There's no air conditioning, you know, 45 minutes stuffed in a carriage for the people. Did that for nearly 10 years. It's horrible. <laughs> 
uh, and in the last two years I did what you, I, not intentionally but I found a way to make that journey really exciting and it was through podcasts um, and every day so I was so excited that basically every morning for 45 minutes on the way up there and the way back I was learning so learning all these new things um, through podcasts and I actually forgot that I was even on the journey because I'll be sitting in a, in a seat or even standing up just hearing from you know the most inspiring leaders all over the world through podcasts and all different topics all different areas and I learned so much through those two hours in the day where I was traveling and it became actually a really enjoyable experience I didn't do that intentionally like what you just said but <laughs> that's what happened to me so I can certainly see what you mean there so that's a great piece of advice rather than just thinking about it as oh I gotta do that today, <laughs> so I'll do that today. yeah absolutely what, what are some of the other things we can do to stay, um, stay happy yeah, so med- topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. I think meditation is a great one um, that, um, you know, takes no time, five minutes, 10 minutes a day. Um, and, and that really kind of helps you to get more centered, um, helps to kind of reduce stress. Um, it's something you can kind of do anywhere, um, you know, for the most part. So that's that's another one um, that uh, that I like to give to people that I think, you know, if you um, aren't into meditation or if you feel like maybe it's this new age kind of yeah, blah blah it's thing it's a misconception though isn't it exactly i use and, headspace and, for example i use an app yeah i was just gonna recommend oh. i love head oh yeah exactly so so i think people think there's some you know some spiritual thing where you've got to sit in a room and light a candle <laughs> or whatever <laughs> like but it's not that is it uh so do you, do you use headspace as well Yes, I love Headspace. And it's a great way to get acquainted with meditation in not a threatening way. I think some people are like, well, I can't just like not think of anything or, you know. It's it's pretty hard though. (laughs) It is, it is. And it really trains you on like how to how to get there, which is good. So it's not as intimidating. Yeah. I think that, that that's a great starting point. Yeah. And it's also, it's in a it's in a form format that people can consume. People are used to having apps. That they can learn from and stuff like that so it's Absolutely. translated into a format and uh, that people will feel comfortable with because when i when i first heard about meditating i was like oh i was like i don't know about that not sure if i'm gonna do that <laughs> and then someone mentioned oh there's a few apps you can use and immediately i was like okay great uh, exactly. and i originally use headspace so you just to sleep as well so i, I yeah. struggle, struggle sleeping so i listened to like a one of the headspace um meditations and go to sleep so there's multiple yeah. benefits it's uh, great for that, for sure. Yeah, it's almost, it gets a bit addictive after yes. a while. So, yeah, and I think the, the nice one, there's ones in there where you can just, you know, if you're having a really bad day and you're getting really stressed out, you can just step away for a few minutes. So even step away, you can just put your headphones in at your desk and then just hit one of those headspace sort of timeout uh, ones and just, you know, for, for five to 10 minutes, just, just recenter yourself and then, and then get back to your day. Um, yeah. So, so many benefits. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up now. <laughs> no, one's brought, no one's brought it up, and and if there's and these are these may seem like very small things, but they can make. No, a but they difference. add up for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think you know little things add up to big things. Um, it's something that I that I I really believe in, not just within the HR profession, which I think is really true, but um, mm-hmm. you know outside of that. And I think just these little differences that you could do that aren't you know huge efforts that are going to, you know, really kind of take time out. Um, they're, they're easy to, to implement and they're easy to sustain over time. And I think they, they make a big difference for sure. Yeah. And you're talking about wellness earlier. I, sp- I had the Unilever's chief learning officer on the show recently to talk about their wellbeing program that they've rolled out globally. And they have an app like Headspace for their employees. Wow. And it doesn't cost a lot of money either. These are, these are small, these are things you can put in place to help your employees, you know, um, and, and they've got an app, I think it's their own custom app, but it, it would, it wasn't too expensive for what I understand. And giving your employees the ability to do that, um, is this, again, it may seem like a small detail, but the impact you can have, especially if you're a Unilever and you've got hundreds of thousands of employees, even if yeah. you're making, even if you're making an impact on 3% <laughs> of your, work, of your, of your workforce <laughs> and, and, and helping them with their well-being and their happiness, it's huge. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, that like leads us quite nicely onto the quick fire round. I think we can get carried away and talk forever on this show with you. <laughs> I, I, love, I love your energy. So I really t- appreciate you taking the time out to join us on here. Um, so you probably know how this is going to go. <laughs> you've got five, you've got five, we've got five questions and you've got no longer than 30 seconds to give us an amazing answer. Oh, goodness. So, okay. Yeah, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> what, was the, what was the one number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a senior HR leader? Ooh, um, 
I would say probably confidence. Um, you know, it's it's tough sometimes. Uh, you know, working in a male dominated industry, as I've you know, I've, as I have heavily in my background before, um, to kind of feel that level of confidence to push back sometimes um, and to really challenge the business as it needs to. And I think. Um, to take yourself kind of out of the story a little bit um, personally and to um, recognize that, that you have the same intentions as your senior leaders, which is to, to serve the business in the best way possible, I think has really been huge for me in, in making that difference. Fantastic. Um, what's one book or multiple books, if you want, that you would recommend to our audience and why? Um, something that I'm loving right now um, is Energy Leadership by Bruce D. Schneider, um, who is the founder of IPEC, the executive coaching program that I went through. Um, and what I love about it is it teaches you how um, kind of different um, mindsets um, really impact an organization and in and, and yourself personally, and, and kind of gives you tips on um, how to kind of raise the consciousness um, for yourself and also across your organization. Um, and, and kind of gives really good case studies on organizations that succeeded and what they did great in, in that regard and, and some that didn't um, and, w- and what they could have done to, to make it better. So definitely would recommend that. Fantastic. Book. Fantastic. Um, could you share some internet resources that you use to stay up to date with current events um, that you use for your own productivity? You know, when you turn on your computer every day, what's on your Google browser? What, what applications are you using to on a day to day basis? Yeah, I know this one is super boring, um, but I really like like LinkedIn for me is everything. I'm just going to um, list it in there as the first one. Everyone <laughs> says it, so you're not the only one. I, I, I know, <laughs> I know. And I think like SHR too and starting in recruitment, that's like my Bible for everything. <laughs> um, so I think really like LinkedIn for me, it's like the first, you know, I check that sometimes even before my email. So I, I, would do, say I do too. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> What about other, anything else you use in terms of staying up to date with stuff that's going on in the industry? Do you you used to subscribe to anything, any other platforms that could be interesting? Yeah, you know, um, I really um, am enjoying Wired um, as as a great one that I like to look for. Um, Apple News is great too, because it just kind of pops up um, on and then different kind of like articles and feeds that I follow, um, which is great. So I get a notification and immediately kind of makes me read it, which is, which is Mm -hmm. great. Um, and then I think also to just, um, you know, having a strong network, I think is, has been really valuable for me and kind of learning best practices and and what some of my peers are doing in other industries. Um, just out of curiosity, how often do you get to, to, how often do you step away from the office to sort of network and benchmark with peers just out of curiosity? Yeah, I try my best to do it um, at least twice a quarter um, outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, and then yeah. I have my immediate kind of mentors and peers that I talk to on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, probably at least once a week, um, I'm connecting with my mentors. Um, and I'm actually seeing them today, which will be, which will be nice. Fantastic. And yeah. uh, what's one thing about your business that most excites you today? Oh, my gosh. I just think, you know, where it's going. It's just totally, you know, uncharted territory. Um, and it's something that, you know, helps both the environment and people to live safer, better lives. Um, and that to me is just what's, what's so exciting and, and just kind of where we're headed. Um, I think it's very, very unique and um, will add a lot of value to, to the world. Fantastic. Well, I can already feel it with enthusiasm. So <laughs> energy, <laughs> energy says it all. Well, Danielle, you've been an amazing guest. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. To, to join this was us. great. <laughs> before we leave you, before we leave you, one, if there's one parting piece of guidance you can give to all of the other HR leaders out there or, oh you know, the managers, the managers that are on their journey to, to where you are today, you know, what, what advice would you give them? And also let us know the best way that we can get in contact with you if, if we'd like to reach out. Yeah, um, I would say the number one thing for HR, I think, is um, to be kind to ourselves. I know that that sounds like really silly and simple, maybe, but uh, we're we're constantly taking care of everyone else. Um, and then I, I I sometimes feel maybe um, HR we we take care of our own house um, when we can get to it. And so I think it's really important that. Um, that we take care of ourselves, enjoy our successes, take time out for ourselves as HR to do team building and, um, you know, just foster that positive environment because we're really setting the tone throughout the organization. Um, So that's something that I think, you know, really makes a difference um, for for HR function. So that's something that we've been doing um, here at Volvo and and something that um, that has really made a difference in in other teams that that I've worked on that I would, would recommend. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, um, again, LinkedIn is my viable. So I would say definitely, um, you know, message me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always loving to, to talk to different people and hear about their stories. 
Fantastic. Well, guys, you heard it there. Head over to hrleaders.com. Um, there you'll find all of the show notes on the episode, everything we're talking about. I'll link everything up there. Um, Danielle, thank you again for taking thank the time out so to join much. us and uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you soon again. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Bye. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment and share so that others can benefit from the great knowledge and experience. See you tomorrow.